Well, if you're tuned in right here to Tent Talks Tunes, you're probably thinking, well, gosh dang, I haven't seen one of these things in a while. The Malcolm Tent Solo LP, The Multiple Moods of Malcolm Tent. Why on earth is this old fossil dragging that old fossil out for show and tell? Well, quite frankly, I'm not too sure. I think that it might relate to uh, a line of questioning that a fossil in the works has lined up for me. The backstory is this. A uh, short while ago, I did an interview with anti-scene super fanboy Jason Wood. And it was a great line of questioning. Uh, I believe that by the time we have this aired, you can be able to watch that on the anti-scene YouTube channel and or Facebook page to see what happened when I asked this guy what it's like to be a lifelong fan of the almighty anti-scene. When it was all over and the dust had settled and we're, you know, sipping our martinis and patting ourselves on the back for a job well done, Wood said, you know, how come it is that no one ever interviews you? And I said, I don't know, Jay. <laughs> Wood. Here we are. Yeah. And yeah, here we are. So here I'm we are. I'm not going to say anything else. I'm going to bat the ball. I'm going to bat the badminton birdie right over to Jay Wood, and he's going to interview me for a change. So <laughs> Malcolm, thank you so much. First off, thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, I go way, way back with Malcolm, very uh, influential in my formative years. And, uh, you know, yeah, how come no one ever interviewed him? I said, I'm the guy for the job. I'm going to ask him all the hard-hitting questions. Now, what this isn't going to be, Malcolm, people watching, this isn't going to be – What's your favorite record? What's your favorite? What's your favorite album with a gatefold sleeve? Which which might be a good TED Talks tune, believe it or not. Which albums? I don't know. Anyhow, these are going to be questions about life, everything that you've done. How'd you end up here? The the three stages of Malcolm. And, and I will preface by saying you have been in a lot of bands and put out a lot of stuff. We are going to be focusing on three distinct topics of questioning the first topic is going to be broken talent years okay so i have 10 questions here about broken talent malcolm are you ready to take a trip down memory lane who would i'm ready okay question number one you had the idea to form your first band at a high school talent show called the freaky funky follies and your band was called the punks is that correct Jay Wood, you have done some research. Oh, just wait, Mr. Tent. Is that correct? Was your original band called The Punks? That is completely correct. I can't dodge that bullet. I have to tell it like it is. Yes, in the year 1980, I think it was, uh, to form a group called The Punks made perfect sense. It was the right decision at the right time. And uh, considering that it was a high school talent show, I stand by my, my decision to do so. And truthfully, I, I don't think it was my idea to call it the punks. I think it was the idea of our guitar player, a guy named Phil Wicks, who was way better of a musician than any of us were. Okay. But when, you know, when it came to band names, uh, the record speaks for itself. It just is what it is. You know what can I Yeah, do? okay. And that brings us to question number two. When you guys formed your actual band, it was actually called Broken Palette, but was spelt wrong on the flyer and it was spelt Broken Talent. And you guys being young rock and rollers said, all right, we're Broken Talent. Is that true or false? That is completely true. That's the kind of thing that you would expect to see in a movie such as Spinal Tap. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but that is exactly it. I mean, when we were brainstorming the name for a band, I proposed that we come up with the most painful bodily injury that you could think of as our band name. And, I, and we all yeah. sort of agreed, well, what could be possibly more painful than a broken palate, you know, the roof of your mouth? So it was going to be broken palate. And I guess, I guess the phone connection was kind of staticky <laughs> back in those days. <laughs> you know, in the, in the 305 area code. So yeah, imagine our surprise when we saw the first flyer and it said broken talent. <laughs> well, could be, it could have been a blessing in disguise. 
I guess, because we're, you know, we stuck with it. We were like, well, since it's that way on the flyer, I guess that's our name from now on. And so yeah. it was. Yeah, I love it. All right, moving on. Question number three. The band made its way to New York to record its first single, Blood Slut, in 1984 in a woman named Cat's living room. Is that correct? That's about 50-50 correct. Okay. Um, we did not travel to New York to do that. We traveled to Coconut Grove, Florida. Oh, okay. And I don't know what the geography is like now, but at the time, Coconut Grove was like this really neat little enclave of old South Florida. It hadn't, okay. been, hadn't been strip mauled. It hadn't been bulldozed. It hadn't been condoed. It was really one of the very few places in South Florida that had real flavor in a sort of atmosphere to it yeah and cat was our drummer and that's where her family lived and okay you know her her older brother who had been at a wild new year's eve party the night before um dragged his completely hungover butt out of bed and <clears throat> we had you know and same deal i can't make any of this up we had like some cheap Radio Shack microphones. We had this ancient reel-to-reel -reel recorder and some ancient old reel-to-reel -reel tape that we found in a closet somewhere at the University of Miami. And he had a mixing desk. Wow. Just and that like was that. it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And then, so Blood Slut, the seven inch comes out and that is TPOS number one, correct? Number one, baby. Number one. We're going to come back to TPOS in a second, but what does TPOS stand for? Well, is it classi classified? You could say classified and we can skip. It's up to you. I'll just leave it at this. It originally stood for something, which um, okay. quite often I'm in, we're talking about childhood stuff here. Yeah, right? of course. You know, so I'll spill the beans. As I'm fond of saying, the only thing I ever got in trouble for in high school was because I was a good kid, you know, I was like honor yeah. roll, dean's list, you know, honors classes. I was always one of the smart kids and I was definitely like too cowed to actually be a real rebel. Right. So the one thing that I came up with with my friend Rick, who later became the singer for Broken Talent, and it, it was actually his idea to publish an underground newspaper. And the name that he came up for it was the piece of shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which, which even at the time I was embarrassed by. I thought that was really stupid. Yeah. Um, Rick, if you're out there watching, sorry. I thought it was really dumb. But you know, it was kind of the same deal as the broken talent flyer. We, you know, I was just there to kind of roll with it. And uh, yeah. It's got a good ring to it. All right, so now we all know. All right, we have a lot to cover, so moving on. Broken Talent was often or is called Florida's Flipper or Florida Meets Devo. Do you agree with that comparison? Um, not 100%. Um, we weren't trying to be Flipper per se. Okay. I mean, Flipper was one of the, the bands that we all agreed on, like uh, myself, Rick and Mark, our guitar player, we were unanimous in our love for Flipper. Okay. Um, Rick and I were heavily into Devo. Um, all three of us loved the Velvet Underground. Uh, Mark was a giant Mark for the New York Dolls. Yeah. And so we, we took all these influences together along with Joy Division and just punk and hardcore in general and applied our extremely limited skill set to trying to make music that we liked that was definitely influenced by all of those bands. Yeah, okay. And the result, That's interesting. You know? Yeah, I got that was uh, just an article, just basically researching Broken Talent. That was one of the comparisons. Um, you know, I, I couldn't say agreed or disagreed. I thought I'd save it to ask you. Um, this could be a long question. Let's keep it relatively short though. How is your songwriting uh, skills evolved over the years. So if you're writing for Broken Talent, this band, does it, oh, five minutes, let's just put it out and play something. Can you still write that fast? Do you still write the same way? Absolutely. Um, I've always, 
I don't know if it's a belief or not, but for me, the songs come real fast. You okay. know, like like if I had a guitar in my hand right now, I could probably write you a song. Um, whether it be any good or not, I don't know. But I, I just have this ability, I don't know why, but I can just, I can spin riffs. Yeah. I can improvise them instantly, which uh, will, co will come into play later, I'm sure, with the next line of questioning. Um, so to this very day, that's how I do it. Uh, I did it this morning. I wrote a, a song for my, my band, The Bloody Apostles. It just came. Just like that. Yeah, just yeah. like that. Yeah, so, and you, you've, always, you've always had such a strong vernacular. Also, like you, you've always, since I've known you, yeah, I remember, Malcolm, how do you get so smart? Like, I just read everything in front of me and you would just, you've always just had a like, language has always just come really easy to you. So that's interesting. Much, All right. That is crazy. Yeah. And I just, I'll add one more yeah. thing. When I mentioned Mark, the guitar player for Broken Talent, he showed me a lot of the real fundamental tricks about writing a song, like how to compose a hook and um, what is a tasty chord progression, stuff that is dead bones simple but absolutely effective so mark salute you yeah i love it all right number seven being in bands tends to bring a loyal group of followers and loyalists you know the groupies the band people what can you tell us about the broken talent auxiliary corporation well uh, I, I i again got to commend you on your your muck raking you really come up with some nuggets here i'm i'm, I'm into this malcolm i got gotcha. you well okay if we want to be correct it was the broken talent auxiliary core okay and the broken talent auxiliary core was just a whole bunch of fellow weirdos nebbishes freakazoids and outsiders like us who just didn't fit in anywhere else you know it's like we we weren't really punk rock we weren't really hardcore we weren't quite new wave we we certainly weren't metal heads we were just these dudes and these guys and gals who didn't really know how to we didn't know how to dress cool we didn't know yeah. how to make a, a good haircut we didn't know anything you know except we just wanted to have fun and and to use what I said earlier, take our limited skill set and make music and art that, yeah. you know, probably really did exceed our grasp. And so just by the sheer dint of going out and doing it and having the, the gall to actually, you know, set foot on a stage somewhere and put out a record, like-minded people sort of yeah. gravitated to us. And it was great. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of good people, people who I am friends with to this day, you know? Wow. Great. Yeah. Like a, it's an early you know, confederacy of scum almost like, or just like a group of, you know, I don't want to say misfits, but like, Hey, we're like-minded. We got our click and our circle. So yeah, great answer. All right. Your current band anti-scene covered a broken talent song years before you joined the band. Is it weird playing it on stage with a different band other than broken talent? Like the first time that you played my God can beat up your God with anti-scene, the baselines a little, you know, it's a little different. It's just enough different. Um, and are there any other broken talent songs that you think should be covered? Well, let's see. <laughs> uh, part one, it was um, weird and wild and wonderful to actually set foot on stage with anti scene. Um, My God Can Beat Up Your God was actually in the set when I first joined the band. Yeah. And the first time I ever played it with anti scene was in Atlanta, Georgia on the opening night of the anti-scene obsessed I hate God package tour um really good house a lot of people there that night and it was very flattering to see how many how many people knew the song yeah you know, and, was, yeah. and it was covered before you were even in the band so like yeah yeah, yeah it's, so it's I, cool. I knew nothing about like one day Jeff Clayton called me up and said hey man what's your mailing address gave him the address <sighs> And like a week or two later, a, a package arrived and in it was the Australian only seven inch single of My God Can Beat Up Your God. And I didn't know anything about it until I actually saw the record and just about had a heart attack and a stroke yeah. at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, once again, salute. Thank you, Jeff and Joe Young and Tom O'Keefe and Steve Sadler for taking that song, stealing it from me, retooling it and keeping it in the public eye 
for all these years, you know, because otherwise yeah. it's a song that might've just sort of come and gone, but they kept it alive. Yeah. And uh, I'll admit I've gotten a lot of mileage out of it. I, I wrote, I worked up my own acoustic version of their version of it. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And now is there another song, had they not picked that, I feel like they might've eventually made their way to doing a Broken Talent song. The album's great, right? That, you know, what other song do you think might be a close second that could have worked? God, for anti-scene? For, uh, yeah, for anti-scene. If they did not cover my... And even if people out here don't know the song titles, we'll get to that later on about how you can get copies of these songs. But just on top of your head, think about that. Yeah, that's an imponderable, uh, imponderable because when it, whenever anti-scene takes a song, they completely make it their own. It's different, yeah. You okay. Know? So yeah. yeah, I got to pass on that one. Gotcha, all right. TPOS 17 was a broken talent reissue of Good, Bad, Awful, and it contains almost all of the recordings of the band. That's correct, right? Yes. Okay. Are there any copies left for people to buy, and which format is that available in, Malcolm? Why, you know, Jay Wood, that's a very good question, <laughs> well, and I'm you. extremely glad that you asked that. <laughs> um, yes, Good, Bad, Awful is available on cassette. It is available on CD. There is also a, an anthology LP called Broken Talent Rules No One that was released on the Florida's Dead label. Okay. I believe in uh, 2016 that came out. And I also believe that it is still available on LP. I'm not sure about that. Um, it got a lot of good write-ups. It, it uh, was named reissue of the you know month or week or whatever in a few places. Yeah. And um, I'm very happy with the way it came out. So yes, if you want it on cassette or CD, you can get it from me, Malcolm Tent, this guy right here, the guy with the multiple moods, or on LP from Florida's Dead. There's also a, a digital version of A Best of Bro Broken Talent on Bandcamp. Okay. Which, you? that No Loyal, or Loyal to No One, but what's the name of the album on Florida um, Records? Rules No One. The whole album, I want to say the digital version, and it must have been a joke. It was nine hundred and ninety nine dollars, but yeah, the individual I mean, songs are like a dollar. I don't know. I think I'll just send you money tomorrow, and I'll, yeah. I'll listen to it because it's great stuff, man. I got to say, even researching this, I you know, I, you basically raised me, and I, I didn't really pay too much attention other than my God can beat up your God. And now that I'm older, that kind of like punky sound is it's it's really good. All right, so that's good to know how to do that. Now, how did playing in Broken Talent shape the way that you play bass now? Are there skills that you might have learned? Trap, and this is, you're early on in your, in your playing career. That album has a bunch of, you know, bass lines that are pretty predominant. Um, how has that shaped how you play bass now? It was basically learning as I go along. You know, uh, the way yeah. it shaped was I was just, I was learning, seriously learning how to play, how to literally connect the dots on the neck of a, of, of a bass guitar you know because if anybody out there has seen the neck of a guitar it's got dots you know and it's and it's got lines between the dots and for me it was always kind of like geometry or math it was a matter of just finding the way that these things connected to each other in a, in a linear fashion and then what kind of interesting shapes can you make out of them? And how does that shape affect the sound? And usually the more interesting the looking, more interesting the shape is, the more interesting the sound is. And it's not always musical, but you can take that and go somewhere else with it. And so that's yeah. really, and that's still the way I do it. You know, I just didn't quite know what I was doing back then. I, I had no knowledge of what a major or a minor was or what a fifth or a seventh was. And even now I hardly do. But um, at the time I absolutely didn't. And so yeah. I was finding out. Yeah, learn, learn trial by fire or something mm -hmm. they say. Um, so now you start pumping out TPOS records. You gotta have a place to store all this stuff. You love collecting records. You open up Trash American Style. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears. That's kind of the broken talent. Okay, we get an idea. Young Malcolm, the musician. Somehow this idea, and that's where number question number one in the trash years, how did the idea of opening up a record store in Connecticut 
even how did that happen? What you show up with a crate of records and you hope, for, I mean, what, what happens there, Malcolm? How, how does this, how does this happen? Well, um, on the one hand, it's a lot easier than you might think it was. On the other hand, it might be a lot harder than you would think it could be. Whew, so much that I have to take a sip of water. This is. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. No, no, you, you, you take a sip. I'll take a sip. <clears throat> Hydration. I have a weird thing. I only drink out of gallons, which is strange, but. Yeah, that's kind of odd. I don't know what it is. I can't, I honestly can't. Um, it's bizarre that we both do that. I can't drink out of a, a glass. It's strange. Well, for me, I mean, the formula that I go by is uh, one ounce of water per pound of body weight. And this is a shoot. I'm not joking. That's yeah. the formula I go by. And I, I weigh about 136. A gallon's 128 ounces. So, you know, I just, it's, it's easy. I fill one up in the morning and finish and it. Drink it. Yeah, yeah. And your skin looks great too. So obviously people at home, that's an unsolicited Malcolm Tent skin tear technique. All right. So it just happened. Is this what we're hearing? You just magically, you get storage space or, uh, you know, you get storefront, you open a store. Is that it? Kind of. I mean, really? Yeah. Okay. It, I mean. It doesn't have to be. That's, hey, you, you, you found a building, you had a lease, you, you know, if you were always kind of smart, you weren't like some junky musician. So you always kind of had your shit together. Connecticut at the spot, seemed to, you know, tri-state area. So, all right. How did the name Trash American Style come about? That was uh, the product of a brainstorming, <laughs> excuse me, brainstorming session between me and my business partner, Kathy, Kathy Kelly of Trash American Style. Uh, we were married at the time. And so we, um, just to give a little bit of background, we, we met in Florida. We ended up in Connecticut because she was from Connecticut. And uh, we both despised Florida so much. We we're at the end of our rope. We are, we're totally on our last nerve as far as Florida goes. So she said, let's go to Connecticut and open up a record store. I said, that sounds great. Let's get out of South Florida. Let's <laughs> yeah. blow this pop stand. So we did. And when we got to Connecticut, it's kind of like what you described earlier. We just hit the pavement and started looking for a storefront that yeah. we could afford. You know, that, that was a big deal, you know, because we we weren't rich. We only had what we had, you know? And so we found this little tiny storefront, put down the deposit, bought some cans of paint, uh, got a bunch of cinder blocks and some plywood. We made shelves. It was really literally that DIY. You yeah. Know? We, we, we did it with what we had on hand, which was a little bit of money, a lot of supplies from the hardware store, what was left of my record collection, what was left of her wardrobe because she had a very good eye for clothing yeah and um one order that i placed with a record distributor and that was it wow. that was the whole shoot and match that we opened up with and so we were brainstorming names you know and a, a big props to a woman named libby bentley who had opened up a uh, really psychotic thrift shop in Fort Lauderdale called Electric Trash. Okay. And we both, we loved that place and we loved the name. And so our, our, we sort of kept gravitating back to that name, but obviously we couldn't just take the name. Yeah. So we just focused on the, the trash aspect of it and just kept turning the wheels until Trash American Style is what came out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a great name. Um, all right. And then trash speaking of, uh, became a destination place for music and punks to meet, hang out, typical record store feel. Uh, what was the philosophy behind how trash was run? Wow. There's a couple of philosophies. Um, probably the overriding one, as far as, uh, just a sheer business model was cheap is real. Okay. I've always said cheap is real. Because, uh, you know, being a record collector and a, a, a dude who's out there in the, the so-called real world, it just really pisses me off when people gouge prices. You yeah. Know? I hate that. Of course. Yeah. It offends me personally. <laughs> yeah. Good. And um, I also, this also goes back to my, my days as a kid. Um, there was actually a comic book dealer who I used to frequent when I was very young I was really into comic books like collectors comic books and silver age stuff and this dude 
would always give me a break if I bought a bunch of comics. Okay. It, it you know, might not even been that much, maybe a buck or two. But the fact that he did that when he didn't have to, that is something else that always stuck with me because it it touched me, you know? Yeah. I was yeah. just some snotty young kid buying comic books, but this guy gave me the consideration of just even a little discount, you know? Yeah. So you think maybe you saw yourself and all these young kids coming in from all different, because you could have been any one of those. You could have been the punk with the mohawk. The punk, like you were, you, you, you born how you were. You were going to be some aspect of that. Might as well be the one, you know, the, the, the sheep herder of all of it, where everyone comes, you know, you know, that's the thing is like, you, you were the destination spot. So interesting. Yeah. So yeah, yeah good. And then, um, I don't mean to yeah. cut you off, but the no, no, go ahead. philosophy was sort of a, um, like what you're just saying, all inclusive, you know, our, our kind of, our deal was kind of like, leave your colors at the door. Yeah. Come in and enjoy the music and hang out, you know, right. and, we, and, and literally everybody was welcome. I, I didn't care who it was, just leave, leave your particular bullshit at the door and let us inflict our bullshit on you because this yeah, is our yeah. store. <laughs> yeah, it was very multicultural. It was a great place, man. Um, you know, there were, so moving on, the, uh, that area also had a few other record stores. Was there any fear of competition or jealousy between you or them? Hey, were they getting better records than you? I, I you know, I don't know if they're still around. Um, so, you know, we know I, there's one I think of particular. I was always a trash guy uh, up the street in a place called Brook. You know, you were the Danbury area. There was a Brookfield one. It kind of didn't have my vibe. There was maybe one or two. It was one in Richfield, which I bought my first G.G. Allen tape out. But nothing like I feel like what you had. Those were record stores. Trash was a, a destination. But yeah, any jealousy or anything between you and them? On my part, no. I mean, um, you know, there, there's always this edge of competitiveness, which I think is just human nature. So yeah. um, on my part, no, there was one guy in uh, very close to where we were. And I'm not, I'm not going to mention names. because Yeah, I, yeah, no, whatever. It's, it's irrelevant. You know, any, anybody who knows the story knows who I'm talking about. But um, this one dude made a real effort to bite off my, my angle. And I, I, know, I didn't like that at all. You know, yeah. the a little originality goes a long way. And this dude was, was uh, expressing zero originality, like to the point where he was trying to pass himself off as a punk, hardcore, industrial metal shop, you know, which yeah. in itself is very limiting, you know. Right, right. You so, can't fake it. Yeah, that dude I wasn't too much of a fan of. But um, as far as the other shops, I mean, I'll name names there. Jarosa Records in Brookfield, who is yep. still at it to this day. Wow. Brian wow. Jarosa, hello. Um, yeah. What we had in Waterbury, the great Grass City Records. Yeah. Big influence. Loved Walter. He was a real, someone who I looked up to a lot in the business. Um, and then others that were just like, you know, kind of around that I was friendly with to one degree or another. Yeah. Uh, I was yeah. friendly with it all, you know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, when do you think the glory years of the store and the area were? Was there a, just a sweet spot where you guys are, hey, let's get, no, maybe not a new car, but hey, we're doing pretty well, you know? When when was that? And, you know, in the area, especially, Danbury was a hotbed um, for, you know, it was the next Seattle at one point. It was shaping up to be that way. We had a lot of bands come through and it was, it was hot. Well, what was your experience like? When do you think that was? Well, to me, that's very easy to quantify. That was 91, uh, you know, whenever 1991, <coughs> excuse me. And I can actually, for whatever reason, I can pinpoint the date when it peaked was October of 95. Yeah. Um, I will stress by saying that the entire run of trash that we had was awesome. All the whole 21 years was great. And each era had its own you know, yeah, highs and lows, you know, some, some eras were definitely lower than others. Some were higher than others, but in terms of what you're talking about, when everything was just like slam, bam, bang, wham, 91 to 95. Yeah. That was the only time in the entire history of trash American style that I was actually able to put money in the bank. Yeah. 
and at the at the height of this thing i had eight people working there um it was nuts i mean you were there you know how cool oh yeah yeah no it was great and that's and those people went on to do a lot of really great things too and it was this chunk of time that i remember you know um yeah nothing nothing's gonna beat that for sure mm -hmm. um and like i said is you know all these i'm trying to keep all these questions relatively short answer these are all things that can be talked about in depth kind of later on so um number eight and this I actually don't know if it's true. I don't even know if there's anything there, but I, I was mentally kind of thinking there was something here. Is it true that you're the one that connected Anti Scene to Dennis Dunaway from the original Alice Cooper band? Because, yes, go, go on. Um, just a little bit of fact checking. Uh, Anti Scene worked with Michael Bruce. Okay. The Alice Cooper group. Okay. And they made that connection in a very, <laughs> very random roundabout fashion. And um, Jeff Clayton, I'm pretty sure has told that story um, on his show, which is called Break On Through. Okay. Which of course can be found on the Anti-Scene of course. YouTube channel, which I curate. Um, now I was an absolute fanboy and Mark for Alice Cooper. So I made my own field trip to find Dennis Dunaway Okay. A bunch of years ago, the, the bass player and the yep. engine of the Alice Cooper group. Okay. So that's a whole other story in its own right. But okay. I remember there was something there. And then, because it was actually Michael, the person who sings on Sick Things is Michael Bruce, right? Well, no. Or is no, it? no. In, in, the, in the Alice Cooper group, Alice Cooper, Vincent Fournier does all the singing. But most of the music was written by Dennis Dunaway, Michael yeah. Bruce, and to an extent, okay. Neil Smith. Gotcha. Okay. I remember there was something there. So, all right. Thanks for clarifying that up. All right. What is the number one, number one, if you think about the top of your head, lesson you learned from running an independent record store for so many years? You're, you elaborated before you said, you know, cheap is good or whatever, but what's the, what's the number one lesson you learned? The number one lesson that I learned that I applied while I was doing it and what I apply to everything that I do now is that if you're going to do something, be prepared to bleed for it. And if you're gonna bleed for it, you better love the taste of blood. What I called it at the time was the TTE, which stood for total trash existence. You can't do anything half acid. You can't yeah. do anything apologetically. You can't do anything wringing your hands and saying, oh, well, you know what I really meant was, no, you got to do it. And yeah, commit. You have to be prepared to sweat and bleed for it. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day, take the satisfaction and the, the fruits of your labors and the joy of having achieved what you've achieved. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So sadly, trash closed down. After the store, you went mobile and took your records. You took your records to the people. How can people track down Malcolm Tent's traveling record store? Well, Jason Wood, I'm glad you asked that. You're asking all the right questions. These are you? not even, play guys, I just want to stress this. Malcolm had no idea. I have, Malcolm can write, you know, he can write songs fast. I can think of questions fast. He had no idea I was going to ask him this. It just worked out the way it did. Malcolm, how can people get a hold of the traveling record store? Well, these days, you know, when you've got this thing called the internet and Facebook and Instagram and all that jive turkey, um, I'm very easy to find. I mean, if anybody's watching this thing right now, they're probably either on my Facebook page or my YouTube channel, but I'm very fond of my website, which is malcolmtent.net, and uh, I should be a prepared guest. I might be able to actually just kind of reach over here to my right, only a couple Ooh. of feet away. Look at this. This is the way we do it in the modern age. I have the placard right here. It's got the handy <laughs> web address, malcolmtech.net. Um, Jason Wood, why are you spitting on your camera? I am? Oh, no, it was a little bug. Oh. I'm in Denver, man. It's like the desert out here. There's like bugs all over the place. All right, malcolmtech.net. Malcolmtent.net is a one of the gateways to everything I do. You can also go to trashamericanstyle.us. <laughs> Excuse me. Trashamericanstyle.us. You can also look up TPOS, 
the aforementioned TPOS on Discogs and eBay. I love it. You can't find me now. You're not doing your work. Yeah. Or they can also, when anti scene starts, you know, a tour, me, whatever they got going on, you being the newest base member, let's talk about you and anti scene, Malcolm. So you are the newest member of the band. What is the biggest thing about the band that surprised you when you first joined? Wow, the biggest thing that surprised me. Like, oh, wow, you know, this really is a, uh, how much they practice or how, or how much of an influence other music is. What, was there anything, or, or maybe there wasn't because you had already been around the band and recorded with the band for so long, you might've already known, but was there, you know, you're playing a show, like if you could think of anything, great. If not, no big deal. Actually, if the one thing that maybe didn't surprise me so much, but has really impressed me when I sure. really started to get to know the dudes in the band was the sheer depth of musical knowledge that everybody in that band has. You know, like I yeah. thought I was the champion music geek. The, any one of those dudes in the anti scene will give me a run for my money in terms of really knowing their shite musically. And I'm talking yeah. about across the genres, you know, yeah, you know, everything from 70s RB to country and western, um, to kiss to Black Oak, Arkansas to avant garde free jazz, yeah, and all of it. It, it's incredible you know it's like when we're on the, when we're in the van and we're on long trips i mean anything could break out on the playlist you know when we're listening to, to music any artist could come up in the discussion between everybody and yeah. our, yeah. our road crew too you know the guys you know, like roadies and merch people everybody knows their stuff and that yeah. that was great you know to be able to have these kinds of in-depth conversations where we all can match each other with just sheer geekiness, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, well, I, I know, and I had mentioned that those little, uh, the talks that you and Jeff did where you guys were pulling out records, it's uh, it was super fun and you could tell that it was two equals that you guys were, it, it was really pleasurable. So moving on, how has your past experience in the record industry and playing in bands prepared for this new, obviously anti-scenes, they're not buying, kind of operation so how has everything you've done prepared you for this new role well basically just it uh, gave me the ex the experience you know all all the dumbass mistakes i ever made especially in the early days of my various bands yeah i've made all those dumbass mistakes and i typically don't make them anymore you know yeah well in the practice recording you bring that in as well yeah, right. You know, all that, you know, it's just very, very simple stuff. Show up on time, uh, be prepared. You know, if you've got a set list, know all the songs. <laughs> if you don't know the songs, learn the songs, you know? It, it's, <laughs> yeah. It's just so simple, really, when you think about it. But, you know, I can look back at, you know, when I was younger at an early age when it, you know, a lot of things just seemed like a lot more work than they actually were. Um, and they're not. You know, as long as you just perform your due diligence and you show up ready to do your job, everything's cool. Yeah, rock and roll. I love it. What is your favorite song, could be currently, to play live? Oh, man, that's... Now, this could... Now, it, here's the trick question. I didn't realize, you know, typing this out is you might not even have played your favorite song. The big catalog. I mean, it just seems deep. So you may not even know what that song is yet. Currently, song that you have played that you love playing right now. Well, I'll tell you why that's kind of tough is because everybody has input to the sets, which was something else that gratified me very much. You know, I, I get asked all the time, what do you want to play? And so mm -hmm. I always I always suggest my favorite songs. And so far, almost every one of them has made it into the set. So I'm oh, all right. These songs that I worship, like Sod, Fornication, Funk You, but 
I'll have to say right now, my favorite one to play is one that I didn't even know before I joined the band, Fight Like Apes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a great song. Goosebump yeah. City, baby. Playing that song is a It's chat. a heavy, that's a heavy, heavy, that, that song just hits when that comes in. Yeah, that's a great, great song. All right. Yeah. <laughs> During your South Florida days, you and your friends would call noise music hangcore or hardcore art noise grunge. Would this title fit anti scene? Well, you know, in a really, really abstract way, it kind of does. Of course. You know, Feedback, you got it. it absolutely, I think it does. Something like Atomic Clock, that's kind of artsy. You know, even the new uh, split with Before I Hang, that's got definitely the Jim Joe. So, can't you see now? Jeff Clayton's going to love this. They're not going to be called Hangcore. <laughs> right, you, you, this is all your stuff, Malcolm. So, you would agree? Are we in agreement? I totally would because all, all those four elements hardcore, art, noise. And if you want to use the word in its strict definition, grunge, in terms of like real grungy sound. Yeah. Of course. Jason Wood, you're a genius to ask a question like that. Genius. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. What is your favorite moment being in the band so far? Oh God, that's that's an easy one. That that's one of those. Oh man, I had one of those moments. Um, first tour, as mentioned before, the I Hate God Obsessed tour. We did 10 days with them. Yep. Um, that alone is a feather in the cap. It's a hell of a way to start the career with this band. Uh, we were playing a gig and um, on this tour, we were the first to go on of the, of the package bands. Usually it'd be some local bands and then yep. us and then the obsessed and then I hate God. So we're at this one venue and we were setting up and there was this young dude there and um, he was really young. He had like you just had that look. He had the like kind of long, scraggly brown hair and like a peach fuzz mustache. He was, you know, kind of a pallid guy. Uh, he was about the same build that I was when I was that age, which was scrawny. Yeah. He looked like me. And I, I'm, you know, the, as I'm describing this guy, he reminds me of me when I was that age. Okay. Well, this guy was, he was a little more cool than I would. He had his, had his battle jacket. He was actually at a show, you know, which I didn't start going to shows until somewhat later in the game. But this is one of those kids where you knew that he was the only one in his class who yeah. liked music, let alone good music. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was at the show early and he was right up in front of the stage and I'm setting up and, you know, I'm looking over and I could tell he was excited to be there. And I said, you ever seen anti-scene before? And he said, no, no, but I've heard about you guys and I'm really, I can't wait to see you. And I said, just you wait. And so... We get on, we play our set, and this dude is right down in front, and he's banging his head and fist pumping, yeah. and I just about choked up because I was like, "God damn, we're there's the connection." Yeah, yeah, what a great story! It was great. I I played my entire I played the entire show to that kid that night. Yeah, that I hope he's. I wonder if he's out here watching. No, I'd love to find him. He's a yeah, member of just you know Destructo Central. So what a great story! Yeah. All right. Former anti-scene bass player Tom O'Keefe left the band to become the tour manager of Weezer and Train, two completely opposite ends of the spectrum from anti-scene musically. Who is someone else that you were surprised that you found out that they liked the band? Has there been someone else that you've seen at a show like, whoa, what are you, you know, I know Phil Ensamo wears his anti-scene shirt, Jello Biafra has been around. Is there anybody... You know, if you see a picture of Tom O'Keefe backstage at a giant thing with an anti seat, that, that, you know, that would catch your eye. Is there yeah. anyone that you've been surprised by? Well, actually, it turns out that Fishbone are big fans of anti Oh, cool. Yeah. And All right. Fishbone's there. awesome. Fishbone are great. I mean, and there's always sort of been this loose talk of a Fishbone anti scene tour. Wow. Which, wow. Uh, Why not? I wish it would happen. I, I, of course, I'd be yeah. there in like less than a second. That'd be. Awesome. We got to play yeah, all right. Fish, every night. Man. Fishbowl, that's oh, great. Yeah. All right. That's great. That's great. That's uh, you just never know. That's a good thing about music, too, is everyone's, you know, if, if you like music, you like music. So uh 
this last, this is the last question that I have for the anti. It's kind of what I have written out. So, and I think this might be a good segue in. We have a lot of musicians who are probably watching this interview. Maybe they want to, you know, emulate the anti scene sound. What kind of bass do you play? And do you do anything special with, you know, knobs and this and who dads to get that anti scene sound? Because watching you guys play and, you know, do your little thing before a show is way different hearing each individual component, you know, Barry hits a snare a couple of times, boom, boom, boom. And then all of a sudden the wall comes out, sounds a lot different. So what kind of, what kind of bass do you play and how do you get that sound? Well, all right. Um, my weapon of choice when I hit the stage with anti-scene is a PVT-20 bass. It's one that I bought, <coughs> excuse me. It's one that I bought in the Broken Talent days. It was actually the first real bass that I had in Broken Talent. Before that, I was playing nothing but really cheap made in Korea knockoffs, like three quarter <laughs> scale, like three quarter scale cheap garbage, because that was all I could afford at the time. And so this PVT 20 I bought for 125 bucks, case included um, at the time. And it was it was on the, the wall of this records of, of this music shop in Fort Lauderdale forever nobody bought the thing you know and I always had my eye on it and finally I scraped up the 125 and bought it and used that for the last part of Broken Talent oh, okay and so I've had that bass ever since it's just a PVT 20 everything on it is stock it's got this I don't know what kind of pickups PV uses but they are a wicked nasty sounding pickup yeah with real bite <sighs> and so Right off the bat, the natural sound of it is good. Um, amp wise, I'm using Barry's Mesa Boogie 215, which um, I've never had to turn up past four. Wow. <laughs> that, that thing's a vaporizer. Um, and then as far as effects, I change them up a little bit, but essentially the, the core to my effects rack is a Boss Overdrive. I've got uh, two different types of boss overdrives that I use. I use a cheap Behringer knockoff of a boss overdrive. Um, sometimes I switch back and forth. Sometimes I use them together. Okay. Uh, on a song like Sod, for example, which has that little bit of extra filth to it. Yeah. I'll run them both together. Okay. Um, and then I have a loop pedal that I'll use to store samples on. And also when we're doing the big destructo finish with the feedback and the mayhem, a lot of times I'll make loops of the just chaos that we're doing and I'll stomp on that and let it play as we leave the stage for maximum. Yeah, hell. just <laughs> wallness. Yeah, that was awesome. Well, Malcolm, this has been great. We actually made it three minutes to spare for our hour block. We could have talked a lot more. Uh, we're trying to keep this structured we could easily do a number two, brother. No problem. Super fun, super informative. Malcolm, before you leave the people in Destructo land and virtual world, what else do you want to give a shout out to? What do you want to say to the fine people out there? Well, I just want to say to the fine people that you are indeed fine people. And I want to thank you for tuning in and listening to all my blather for all these years, either on the stage or, you know, on the YouTube or behind the counter of a record store or a record swap meet or whatever. I really mean that. I'm, I'm grateful to every single one of you who have ever come to a show or bought a record or even just stopped to say hi, because without you, I'm just some schlub sitting around uh, behind a desk, staring into a camera, thinking he's really clever, you know? I, uh, it, it's reciprocal, you know, I, I can't do it without an audience. So thank you. And also thanks to all the incredible bands who I've played with and gotten to see and share the stage with over the years. I mean, that's, that's the spice of life right there, baby. Live music and the experience of it. It's just, there's nothing better. Nothing yeah. Great. Better. Great. Well, thank hopefully we'll get to see. Oh, well, I just want to say thank you, Jay Wood, for asking some really good questions, man. Those, those were good. Yeah, thanks, man. I told you I put a little work into it, man. It didn't take me that long once I found kind of I had some ideas in my head already. And, uh, you know, it's I think because I know you so well, I know the band. it's kind of an easy, easy thing to pop into history questions. So uh, hope everyone else enjoyed it. Don't forget to pick up the Broken Talent CD cassette. I think it's 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 pretty good, man. I was rocking to it out the other day, the digital version, though. I like 
I like stuff in my phone, Malcolm. I'm sorry. Don't you just don't a, hate me. A modern kind of guy. <laughs> I know. Okay. Yeah, I'm on the I'm on the go, Malcolm. Here. All right, guys. Thanks so much, Malcolm. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jason Wood. We're over and out.